Time now for Commodity and Cheap, where we talk to one executive in the commodity world. Today, it's Zach Pariza, NCX CEO and co-founder. Carbon offsets are key to the world's decarbonization efforts, and here's how they work. Nearly 1,700 companies have set or pledged to set net zero targets, and some are even talking about being carbon negative, and they can use more renewables, become more efficient, capture their own carbon. But the problem is, for a lot of those companies, those solutions won't get them to net zero, at least not right away. In the meantime, they need trees, which can offset CO2 emissions. The United Nations Carbon Offset Platform has reached 2 million certified emission reductions purchased and canceled since its launch in September 2015. It's one ton of CO2 for one CER. Now, supporters say it reduces greenhouse gas emissions, supports sustainability in corresponding countries, helps with shade, keeping areas cooler. More shade, less air conditioning, less power consumed. Now, critics worry about the lack of consistency around how offsets are created, plus their issues with its effectiveness. For example, disease and wildfires can ravage forests, disrupting those offsets. Enter NCX, Natural Capital Exchange. It's developing an exchange for these carbon offsets. Now, landowners get paid to not chop down a tree, and a company secures an offset for one year. NCX created an AI-powered forest called BaseMap to help verify the quality of these carbon credits on an acre-by-acre -acre basis. And so far, it represents 670 landowners, 2.35 million acres, and has sold 270,000 tons of carbon offsets. I recently sat down with Zach Pariza, NCX co-founder, and I asked how that verification process works. Not all forests are the same. Uh, so some forests uh, are more able to, to pull out more carbon than, than others. And trees within those forests, some grow faster than others, some are more carbon dense than others. Give me an example of a kind of tree or, or, or forest area that does really well at sucking up carbon. Sure, I mean, you can think of the, the redwoods in, uh, in Northern California. So those forests can grow extremely dense and hold lots and lots of, of carbon within them. If we allow them to continue growing and get to, to uh, older, sort of like at greater uh, levels of maturity. Um, and you have forests in the U.S. South that while they can also pull out a lot of, uh, a lot of carbon, they never quite get to the level of density that, uh, that, we would, uh, that we would see in those forests in California. And it has a lot to do with the soils has a lot to do with the weather, and it has a lot to do with the trees, species that have evolved to exist there. How do you come up with the price? So the landowners come up with the price. Uh, so we run a reverse auction, and that's to drive efficiency in this, and again, to drive transparency. So uh, really, it's to the landowners to state at what price they're willing to defer harvest. And by deferring harvest, they're foregoing the revenue that they would otherwise get from that activity. They're growing their forest longer, which is sequestering additional carbon, but the, that's a real cost to the landowners. Have you noticed what carbon prices really get this thing going? We've seen a complete, you know, price curve. You know, some landowners that didn't clear in the reverse auction and, and some that were stating lower prices. We run a, it's a uniform, uh, uniform price auction, but in our first iteration, it cleared at $17. $17 to defer a large amount of harvest this year to get, you know, an, this, this climate impact that we're seeking. In the second iteration, we brought on far more acreage. We brought on a lot of uh, a lot of additional forest types, and we saw that clear at twelve dollars. And so, um, and so, we're going to see the market price settle, um, you know, and and sort of get uh, get clarity on what that's going to be, and that's going to give confidence to to landowners to you know to increasingly participate. Is there any sort of downside to either planting more trees or keeping these trees uh, not cut down? In that Will there be increased tree cover in places where there shouldn't be? Are we going to see an unintended consequence? Growing more carbon-dense forests does not help with everything. There are some wildlife species that don't benefit from more, more density. Fire risk in the U.S. West doesn't necessarily benefit from more dense forests. Certainly water yield in the West doesn't benefit from, from more dense forests. Trees are, in some sense, like a little water, you know, they're like water pumps. Um, and so... When we look at this solution, it is not as simple as grow more trees and grow more dense trees. We have to look at the entire system. The offsets don't work if the trees burn down. So that's been a challenge with some of these long-term contracts. So you have a landowner with the best of intentions saying, yeah, I'm going to hold these trees here for 100 years. But again, forests are disturbance-based ecologies. One of the benefits to this one-year term is that it's payment on delivery. So you know, at the end of that one-year term, 
we're crediting landowners for what they were able to accomplish in that year. And if they, you know, if unfortunately, you know, the, the forest is disturbed, then there's no credit awarded rather than sort of this long-term pay and pray IOU setup, um, which effectively looks like a big, you know, a long forward contract. How quickly can you scale? I would be disappointed if by this time next year, we weren't also in Mexico and, and Canada and uh, further out from that, obviously, you know, areas of Latin America, of, of, uh, of Africa, of Asia, uh, there's so much, there's so much potential there.